let me uh, welcome you to this breakfast where alongside the, uh, the eggs and uh, croissants, we're going to be serving up a major portion of uh, what the United States can or should do about the Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, better known as the IR. GC um, can't promise you that this will be uh, uh, the healthiest thing in the world for you, talking about the IRGC, but it is certainly a topic of concern, vital concern to the United States, especially in the wake of um, the recent nuclear deal. Now, in trying to assess uh, the agreement that was reached two months ago in Vienna, you, of course, had to focus in the first instance on what the deal did about the immediate problem that it was supposed to solve. That is, you had to evaluate whether the deal actually made it more or less likely that Iran will one day acquire nuclear weapons. But you couldn't stop there because embedded in the deal were a whole series of potential second and third order consequences that also had to be weighed in the balance to determine if the kinds of overall risks that the United States and its allies were taking were really worth running in light of the deal's supposed benefits. I'm referring to things like whether the deal would, was likely to trigger a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, or whether it's likely to weaken or strengthen the Iranian regime's grip on power. But of these kinds of questions that are technically at least outside the four corners of the deal itself, I don't think any of the questions is, is of greater immediate significance than the one that we're going to focus on today, and that is what does the deal mean for the IRGC and its overall support for terrorism and aggression across the Middle East and indeed the world? Do the IRGC and its special forces branch, the Quds Force, stand to be major beneficiaries of the deal? Are we likely to see a meaningful upswing in Iran's destabilizing activities throughout the region? Will the deal likely make the IRGC a more formidable and dangerous enemy for the United States over time, with greater capabilities to pursue its explicit mission of undermining and attacking American interests throughout the Middle East and eventually even driving us from the re uh, region entirely. And if the answers to each of these questions is a depressing yes, what can the United States realistically do now that the deal seems to be a fait accompli to try and mitigate the risks and dangers that will be posed by an emboldened and empowered Revolutionary Guard Corps? Now I should say uh, that there is of course a contrary perspective about much of this that, in fairness, we also need to put on the table, and that's the more hopeful notion <clears throat> that it's not infrequently floated, usually by unnamed administration sources, that perhaps the deal over time will actually end up weakening uh, hardline forces like the R IRGC, C, strengthening more moderate and pragmatic elements inside Iran who have an interest in de-escalating the country's conflict with the West and turning Iran into a more normal nation that so many of its young people genuinely do seem to desire. Now, in this view, the deal could actually become a potent tool of subversion and transformation that promises to work from the inside to eventually put the IRGC and uh, the Islamic Republic itself out of business. Now, I'm personally, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath on this. I uh, don't think I'd bet U.S. national security on it, but I do think it's a viewpoint that's out there that we might want to at least uh, touch on in the discussion today. Now, to help us sort through some of this, we're lucky to be joined by three of my FDD colleagues who have probably all forgotten more about the, the IRGC than I'll uh, ever hope to know. Uh, in all honesty, when it comes to this particular subject, I doubt that you could have assembled in one room more inter intellectual firepower than we've got with us today. Um, you should already have picked up a copy of their full bios, but let me just offer a few of the highlights. Uh, let me begin down on the end with Ali Alfana. Uh, Ali is a senior fellow at FDD and one of Washington's top experts on the inner workings of the Iranian regime of uh, particular relevance to our discussion today. He's the author of the book, Iran Unveiled, How the Revolutionary <coughs> Guards is Transforming Iran from Theocracy into Military Dictatorship. Uh, uh, next, we're uh, also joined by, in the, in the middle, by FDD's Executive Director, Mark Dubowitz, who I think is 
should be pretty well known uh, already by anyone who's spent any time on the Iran issue in recent months, particularly up here on Capitol Hill. Mark is one of Washington's foremost authorities on economic sanctions, particularly as they relate to Iran, having authored more than 20 subjects on, uh, on the overall subject. Uh, since the deal was, uh, the Iran deal was unveiled, Mark has testified four times before Congress and served as an uh, important source of information and advice to members from both sides of the aisle. I should also note that Mark is the executive director of FDD's very important uh, Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance. Uh, finally, we've got Emmanuel Otelengi. Emmanuel is uh, also a senior fellow at FDD. He's done extensive research on covering the role of the IRGC in Iran's economy and, in fact, delivered very important testimony just yesterday on the subject before the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Middle East. And for anyone looking for a really deep dive uh, uh, on the implications of the nuclear deal for the IRGC, I'd strongly recommend that you do. Uh, pick up from the table a copy of Emmanuel's uh, written statement. Now, the way we'll work it today is that we're going to forego formal presentations and get right to the discussion. I'll start by posing a question or two to each of uh, the panelists, but especially because our time is, is rather short this morning, I quickly wanted to open it up to the audience so that you all can take as much advantage of the expertise up here as, as possible. Uh, what I thought I'd do, Ali, is I, I just start with you to kind of uh, at least set the scene for us a, a little bit. Um, as I uh, mentioned briefly, there does seem to be a bit of debate about uh, whether this deal will end up being a good or bad thing for the IRGC. At a minimum, there seems to be an emerging um, conventional wisdom in some quarters that the deal is a significant victory for Iran's president, Rouhani, and his more pragmatic camp and that the IRGC might not be too pleased by the deal or even opposed to it outright. President Obama has gone so far as to say that opponents of the deal in the U.S. were making a common cause with Iran's hardliners, and presumably that includes the IRGC. Now, you monitor uh, political events inside the regime very, very closely, so I'm wondering if you can just kind of give us some clarity on this point. Is there uh, something that we can call the IRGC view of this deal? And if so, uh, how would you characterize it? Well, we have seen uh, several commanders of uh, the Revolutionary Guards, particularly the chief commander, Mr. Uh, Jaffery, Major General Jaffery, uh, opposing the deal systematically throughout the entire process of negotiations. He has accused President Rouhani of giving into pressure from American imperialism, of having a phone conversation with the U.S. president, which is damaging Iran's prestige in the Muslim world as the vanguard of the struggle against world imperialism. And he has also accused Iranian nuclear negotiators of giving too many concessions uh, to the permanent 5 plus 1 group. Uh, but that has all changed. Uh, Monday morning, uh, and this is last Monday, President Rouhani delivered a speech to all major commanders of the Revolutionary Guards, including Major General Jaffari, even Quds Commander uh, Major General Qasem Soleimani, in which he said that the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran needs the help of the Revolutionary Guards to rebuild Iran's economy. Now, that's a very important point because President Rouhani has previously opposed interventions and engagements of the Revolutionary Guards in Iran's economy. But now he seems to have changed his position on this. And he's actively asking for the help of the Revolutionary Guards to, to help develop Iran's economy. And that tells me very, very clearly that there is a deal within the regime. President Rouhani is offering the Revolutionary Guards access to significant money and funding that he can secure from sanctions relief and the nuclear deal in return for the Revolutionary Guards not opposing the nuclear deal. So the Revolutionary Guards, which opposed the deal until Monday morning, may very well be perfectly happy with it now because it realizes that the money is not going to Iran's, what remains of Iran's 
middle class and even the private sector, the money is going to be sent to the companies owned by the Revolutionary Guards. So I think there has been a change in position of the Guards concerning the deal. Yeah, well, fascinating. Um, let me just follow up on that. So, uh, Emmanuel, let me uh, just go to you for a few minutes to describe what the deal might mean, um, the kind of uh, uh, economic incentive that, that the Guard may have in this that Ali, uh, Ali referred to. Uh, you know, U.S. officials tend to make a lot of the fact that the ma vast majority of the sanctions actually in place on the IRGC are not going away as, as part of this deal. So why should we be worried about sanctions relief uh, for the broader Iranian economy? Um, <clears throat> the administration is uh, accurate when it says that the sanctions on Revolutionary Guards companies that have been designated will remain in place and those restrictions will therefore affect them. The problem is that the number of designations there are two problems. The first is that the number of designations uh, against IRGC companies over the years uh, falls way short of the actual number and size of the va vast conglomerates uh, uh, running construction, investment, uh, and other economic activities uh, inside Iran. <clears throat> the administration has sanctioned um, 19 individuals, 23 companies, two academic institutions, and four branches of uh, the, the military of the IRGC. <clears throat> By our count, there are at least um, four to 500 companies that we can identify through open sources affiliated uh, with the Revolutionary Guards. None of these companies is designated, none of these companies is identified as IRGC. So when global business under the agreement, once implementation day arrives, decides to go back to Iran to engage in business, they will look to Treasury and to U.S. legislation for guidance um, to assess their risk in terms of engaging with Iranian counterparts. They will look through the OFAC list and say, okay, I can't do business with these 19 individuals with these 23 companies. But everybody else who's not on the list, who's not prohibited, is allowed. So that's the first big problem. The second big problem is, of course, that um, there will be a lot of business um, both provided by public contracts given by the state in Iran and also business uh, um, worked out with international companies where the main, con the main uh, signatory to the business contract will be a non-designated probably public company, say the National Iran Oil Company, which is slated to be delisted uh, on implementation day. But then that company will contract um, projects within that large uh, tender to IRGC companies. We cannot tell the Iranian authorities to enforce US sanctions against the IRGC, and they won't, of course. And I want to give you one example. Um, Iran has just inaugurated a project to build a $2.7 billion um, speed train connection between Tehran and uh, Isfahan. The project is partially funded. $1.8 billion of the funding will come by Iran's Bank of uh, uh, Industry and Mine, which is on the SDN list, but it's slated to be delisted on implementation day. So this will be a de-designated company, European, Chinese, Asian, South American, African companies can deal with them. The main uh, contractor for the project is U.S. sanctioned, Khatam Alambia. So here you have a perfect example of a joint Iranian-Chinese project, the rest of the funding will come from China, where the main beneficiary will be the IRGC. And this points out to the deficiency of the agreement vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Revolutionary Guards. It will provide an enormous amount of funds and contracts and benefits to the Guards, if not directly, indirectly. Mm. Um, Mark, I wonder if I could, you, you can just pick up on, on what Emmanuel identifies as a serious um, 
problem and vulnerability and uh, in sanctions relief and where it may end up and just and just uh, expand a little bit on the IRGC role in Iran's economy how large are we talking about and I wonder if you can also weave into this your um, you know, particular focus on on the financial end of this and the banks and what the implications of that might be for the IRGC Sure, John. First of all, thank you to everybody for, for coming here, and it's a p particular pleasure to be with my colleagues who've spent so long working on the IRGC. FDD's had a long-standing project on the Revolutionary Guards for many years, and we intend to expand that project uh, with uh, resources devoted to really tracking the Revolutionary Guards and their multiple activities, both with, within the region and within Iran and within the Iranian economy. On the economic side, the, the Revolutionary Guards are a powerful force. They're estimated to control at least a sixth of the entire Iranian economy. Um, but not just a sixth of the entire economy, they control the strategic sectors of Iran's economy. Financial, energy, petrochemicals, uh, mining, construction, engineering, shipbuilding, shipping, ports management, transportation, and as Emmanuel spoke to, Khatam al Anbiya is their major conglomerate um, with uh, 800 subsidiaries and 135,000 employees and tens of thousands of contractors. And the, the IRGC through Khatam al Anbiya has been winning major no bid contracts for years on uh, massive construction, engineering, energy projects. And so what you've got is you've got a force the Revolutionary Guards through Khatam al Anbiya and through a number of foundations like the IRGC Cooperative Foundation, the Basij Cooperative Foundation, that control significant segments of the Iranian economy. I think, um, Emmanuel, you did an estimate uh, with our, one of our other colleagues, Saeed, um, about the control of companies on the Tehran Stock Exchange. And, and I believe, based on your assessment, one fifth of the publicly traded companies on the Tehran Stock Exchange are controlled either directly or indirectly by the Revolutionary Guard. So they are a powerful economic force. And it's critical to understand that with, with respect to sanctions relief, as Emmanuel said, while the U.S. maintains designations on the IRGC itself and on Khatam al Anbiya, the Europeans are either immediately or after eight years going to lift most of the restrictions of the Revolutionary Guards. So Europe will become an IRGC economic free zone. And the Revolutionary Guards will have the ability to do business with European companies and do business in Europe. And so Europe is now their big economic prize. It's why the Iranian government entered these negotiations. It's not to get Russian and Chinese money. It's to get European money and European investment and to sell oil to the Europeans, particularly after the oil sector was so badly damaged by the EU oil embargo and prohibitions on upstream energy investment. So that is the big economic prize. And you've got dozens of, of Iranian banks that are being delisted by the United States and by Europe immediately. And even though the four or five key IRGC banks that were specifically listed for IRGC reasons will remain listed, and the key terrorism bank, Bank Sadarat, will remain listed, dozens of Iranian banks are going to be delisted. That means they're going back onto the SWIFT financial messaging system. That means they're being plugged back into the global financial system. And that means the Revolutionary Guards is free to use those financial institutions f to facilitate financial transactions globally. And so you've got a situation now where, despite commitments by the administration to formally keep sanctions on the Rev Guards itself and on these companies and financial institutions, as Emmanuel alluded to, you're opening up the entire Iranian economy to foreign business and foreign investment, and you're opening up the global financial system to Iranian banks and their business counterparties to do business with Europe. One of the things that I think we should look at, and I'll, I'll just end quickly with this and we can have more discussion on this, is that under US law, the Revolutionary Guards are designated for proliferation purposes. Uh, and then there are executive orders that apply for the Rev Guards' uh, role in human rights abuses, their role in Syria, et cetera. But the Revolutionary Guards have never been designated under US law for terrorism. Right? A branch of the Revolutionary Guards called the Quds Force, which is their extraterritorial arm, right, headed up by Qasem Soleimani, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, Donald Trump doesn't know who he is, but I'm sure many of you know who he is. Um, the Revolutionary Guards themselves that control the Quds Force have never been designated under US law for terrorism purposes. And, and I think one of the things Congress should think about 
is moving forward with a statutory designation of the Revolutionary Guards, either as a foreign terrorist organization or under Executive Order 13224 for its support for terrorism, or both. And we can talk about what the differences are and why it matters. But it's critical that we don't take a two-wing strategy with respect to the IRGC. Right? With respect to Hezbollah and Hamas and Al-Qaeda and ISIS, the United States has been very consistent. We don't distinguish between a political wing and a military wing. Right, like the Europeans, for example, do with Hezbollah. We designate the entire entity because we know that money is fungible and we know that the political wing controls the military wing and they're indistinguishable. Interestingly enough, with respect to the IRGC uniquely under US law, we actually are taking a two-wing strategy. We're refusing to designate the IRGC for terrorism, but we're designating its extraterritorial branch, the Quds Force for Terrorism. So I would suggest Congress taking a look at a formal designation of the IRGC in its entirety for terrorism under U.S. law. Let, let me just quickly follow up with either you or Emmanuel. Um, in terms of the size of the potential windfall where we're talking about that may fall into the Guard's pockets, is there any way to, to try and estimate that? Or, and what would it be? I don't think you can put an accurate figure, but it is in the tens and possibly more uh, of billions of dollars. Just an example, the, the head of the um, uh, Railways Authority of Iran has announced a program to modernize uh, uh, the, the, the train, uh, the railway network inside the country, pledged $25 billion in contracts to do that, and said we will bring in foreign companies for the, project, the projects and the technology and Iranian companies will carry out those projects. So there you have $25 billion pledged publicly by one authority in one sector, and you know that a very significant amount of that will go to IRGC companies to, to, carry, to carry out the project. So we're talking about tens of billions of dollars, and of course, then you have to look at other sectors as well. Mark mentioned uh, the, 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 the stock exchange. Now, the stock exchange has not been performing very well in the short term, but as the economy grows, and prosperity comes to the country again, uh, long term you can expect that to grow. The IRGC has approximately 20-25% uh, of the stock exchange uh, in, a in a variety of investments. Um, that just brings revenues through yields and, and dividends to the companies. That will be more money for the guards. So without, without giving you an, ask, an accurate number, I would say over the course of the next three, four years, we're talking about you know, in the, in the range of 50 to $100 billion between contracts, investments, uh, projects, um, and, and sales. And, and if, you wanted to add, if you wanted to add to that, um, if you looked at the 2015-2016 Iranian budget, um, you'll see the allocations to the Revolutionary Guards directly, uh, to the Besiege, to the Ministry of Intelligence, to um, the defense budget, of which the Revolutionary Guards are slated to get, I think, approximately 60%, and there are double-digit increases in the, in the Iranian budget specifically allocated to the Revolutionary Guards. And, and actually, if you pick up a copy of Emmanuel's testimony, and if you also see, there's a number of policy briefs on our websites uh, that, that talks about this, but you'll see that there is a significant windfall to the Revolutionary Guards from the public budget, never mind all of these other contracts that Emmanuel was talking about, but Rouhani has specifically allocated significant uh, double-digit percent increases to the Revolutionary Guards in their public budget. And I think this gets to Ali's point, um, and Ali, maybe you want to expand on this a bit, but about the, the essential quid pro quo that is going on between uh, Rouhani and the Revolutionary Guards with respect to the nuclear deal and the economic goodies that the Revolutionary Guards are going to get in exchange. Ali, can I uh, just, uh, when you, uh, talk about this, I do want to get in, uh, before we throw it to the audience, just what is, what is it they likely do with this windfall? Okay, this money comes into the, uh, into the hands of the IRGC. Um, do we have good indicators of what this means for the region, for the IRGC, the Quds Force activities in places like Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen, um, the rest of the region? Um, so if you can talk about that as well. Sure. So what we have seen is uh, increased Revolutionary Guards engagement in Syria, 
uh, and uh, to some extent also in, in Iraq. The Revolutionary Guards is a, an economically self-sustaining unit. Apart from the government budget, they get you know, the money through their own companies, and this is how they're financing their activities outside of Iran. Uh, in Syria, those activities include help to the Bashar al-Assad government, suppressing the uh, popular uprising against against the regime, uh, uh, which in reality also perpetuates you know, the, the, the civil war in Syria. Uh, the more money the Revolutionary Guards is using in, in Syria, the more money we are likely to see Sunni supporters of radical uh, Sunni groups give to their own militias in Syria. So, so the, the, the war, unfortunately, just uh, continues on and on. And uh, most unfortunately, the nuclear deal and, and some of the funds which are released to the Islamic Republic of Iran are going to finance those activities. To uh, say something which is even more worrying from a US perspective, uh, uh, we also see the Revolutionary Guards using that money to recruit uh, foreign uh, volunteers to uh, the civil war in, in Syria, including a good number of uh, people uh, from Afghanistan. It is Hazara Shia Muslims from Afghanistan. I have counted approximately 200 casualties, people who died, Afghan citizens who were recruited by the Revolutionary Guards in Iran in return for, for approximately $500 per fighter per month to fight the civil war in, in, in Syria. Uh, so so substantial amount of money is being channeled to that. And just imagine those people, when they return to Afghanistan, they're going to see expansion of the Shia Sunni war between Iran and Saudi Arabia also playing out in the Afghan field. So, so this is you know, some of the problems that you have when the Revolutionary Guards gets hold of more money. I do know that many US officials believe that the money is very small, but the truth is that in this type of warfare, uh, you only need um, marginal, uh, marginally more funding in order to, to continue uh, your, your uh, war. Yeah, Mark. Uh, that's true, though I would, I would just point out that um, according to the UN um, Special Advisor on Syria, the Iranians are funding Bashar Assad to the tune of $6 billion a year. True. Um, so you know, if you looked at the, f the fully loaded cost of what it takes to basically run the war in Syria from an Iranian accounting perspective, you're looking at $6 billion in cash and kind. You're looking at the cost of having the Revolutionary Guards and the Quds Force on the ground there directly fighting and advising uh, the Assad government. And then you're looking at these cash payments that Ali is talking about with respect to foreign recruits. Um, so you're, you're, you're looking at not in the millions of dollars, but in the billions of dollars with respect to the fully loaded cost. And so you can imagine that this sanctions windfall, which is going to be 90 to 120 billion dollars in oil escrow funds plus unfrozen assets, another 20 billion dollars a year in estimated oil sales. Um, even based on these low oil prices, plus petrochemical, plus auto, plus all of this upstream energy investment, um, you're already seeing a significant windfall for the RGC. And as I said, it's reflected in the public budget that, that Rouhani has released, um, which underestimates and understates the extent to which the Revolutionary Guards are going to get hard cash from this deal. But it, it already shows double-digit increases. So you're seeing a, a emboldened, enriched Revolutionary Guards and also one that I think is going to be particularly adept, to Emmanuel's point, at hiding itself and hiding its fingerprints um, in these transactions with Euro the Europeans. Uh, because the Europeans fundamentally can't do business in Iran, in the strategic sectors of the Iranian economy, without doing business with the Revolutionary Guards. Uh, they're, they're going to have to do business with the Rev Guards. But it's going to be incumbent on these companies and these financial institutions um, to try and do sufficient due diligence to make sure that their the counterparty on their business transaction is not a designated, U.S. designated, IRGC entity. And as Emmanuel said, we have very few designated IRGC entities, so it's actually easy for the Europeans to find clean entities that haven't yet been listed. And so, in effect, we have very few restrictions on the Revolutionary Guards and their economic activity, um, which is exactly the way the Europeans want it right now. And so, if we're going to do anything serious about ta targeting the Revolutionary Guards for their terrorism, for their human rights abuses, for their extraterritorial activities in Iraq and Syria, 
and the administration says we're going to be serious about imposing non-nuclear sanctions, we're going to have to impose serious non-nuclear sanctions on the Revolutionary Guards, and maybe we can do this in Q&A. I mean, I have some serious doubts about um, this administration's commitment to do so because the JCPO itself provides the Iranians with an argument to make the claim that any sanctions that are imposed on Iran, nuclear or non-nuclear, would constitute a violation of the agreement, at least in Iranian eyes, and they would then threaten to walk away from the agreement. So, yeah, Emmanuel, you had a point. You wanted yeah, to just a quick point. Uh, I, I am I'm cognizant of the importance of trying to to give a, 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 a more or less accurate figure um, to how much money, um, you know, as a consequence of this deal, the IRGC will be able to get and uh, and and sort of channel to to regional policies that its regime is is promoting. But I think it's very important to make the following point, namely that Iran's regional policy, Iran's support for the Assad regime, Iran's support for Hamas and Hezbollah, Iran's pushback against US influence in the region is not a function of how much money they can put into this mission. It's not that if Iran is having a bad budget year or if Iran's oil revenues go down, um, they will say, you know what, we're going to change our priorities. These things are less important. These policies are the core ideological call of the Islamic Revolution. And the IRGC is the core element in charge of advancing the goals of the revolution. So even if Iran is broke and they have to sell the tiles of the mosque in Isfahan to some art collector, they will do that to continue to promote these policies. So a deal that actually increases the amount of revenue, improves their economy, and puts the main players in that economy in a better, stronger economic position, and those players, we know it, are the IRGC and the Supreme Leader's business empire, means that they will have a lot more resources to assert, consolidate, and strengthen their influence inside the country and promote the core policies that define what the Islamic Revolution is. Okay, um, we, we haven't even gotten to the, the big issue. Mark mentions some of the things we might be able to do to actually try and mitigate these risks of this dramatic windfall to the IRGC and, uh, and limit the possible damage to U.S. interests in the aftermath of this deal. Um, and I hope that'll uh, take place in some of the Q&A, but I do want to uh, throw it open to all of you and see if there are any questions out there. I think we've got microphones, and if you can just identify yourself, please, and keep your question uh, question short. Hi, uh, Thomas George from the Zosima Group. Uh, Ali, you commented in the past that the guards, even under a sanctions economy, were selling cigarettes, all sorts of things, um, obviously much broader than that, the companies you mentioned, but they were still doing relatively well. So, under a pro forma sanctions lifted scenario, it seems that other groups, Zaris and others, will relatively benefit more. Uh, so, can you sort of comment on what the pro forma relative power structure looks like internally, um, and who this sort of benefits, and, and who is seen as a relative leader? So, I think that. President Rouhani's speech uh, on Monday tells us that uh, a deal has already been worked out between the political level, you know, the technocratic elites of the Islamic Republic, led by President Rouhani and the Revolutionary Guards. The Guards, you know, the only reason, or one of the main reasons that they were opposed to the nuclear deal was, of course, their fear that markets would open up and there would be foreign direct investment and that would strengthen the private sector in Iran. But President Rouhani seems to have assured the Revolutionary Guards that even if, even if there is going to be foreign direct investment, those investments are going to be made in the companies of the Revolutionary Guards. And that is the deal that he has been working out with the Revolutionary Guards so they do not oppose the nuclear deal. Uh, who else is going to benefit from it? Well, you know, in the best case, we may see a slight, a slight help, you know, a lifeline almost to, to the extremely weakened private sector in Iran. But 
I do not see them challenge the power of the Revolutionary Guards. Huge conglomerates like, like the Khatam al -Ambia construction base. Those things I simply do not see. Even if President Rouhani wants to help those sectors, he is himself under, under pressure. Let's not forget, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, he needs the support of the Revolutionary Guards. Which institution was it in 2009 which was out suppressing the Green Movement? It was the Revolutionary Guards. So now they are demanding their share of money. And if Khamenei is going to ignore the Revolutionary Guards, he cannot count on their support. Next time there is going to be another Green Movement. So unfortunately, I have to say, you know, I'm very pessimistic about the prospects of the private sector in Iran getting hold of uh, any significant amount of that type of money. So we are not going to see uh, the, uh, the rise of Iranian middle class challenging the regime because of the deal. The deal is actually going to perpetuate the current power structures and the type of military dictatorship that is in the making. Another question? In, in a sense, it's like Russia. I mean, today, if you want to do business in Putin's Russia, in strategic sectors of the Russian economy, I mean, there is no private sector. There are no private actors to go to. You do business with Putin, and you do business with Putin's um, coterie of, of oligarchs. Right? I mean, it's, it's that kind of power structure. In, in, parallel, in sort of analogous terms. So you, you've got to see the Revolutionary Guards um, as the sort of Praetorian Guard of the regime. And I think as Ali is alluding to, Khamenei depends on the Revolutionary Guards for not only regime legitimacy, but regime survival. Uh, and so what we're going to see is, I think what we're all saying is a, a, ma a massive payoff to the Revolutionary Guards who will be the main beneficiary of, of this nuclear agreement. Yeah, please. I think it's a great insight. First of all, thank you for your service at, at the State Department and for everything you've done on this issue. Um, I mean, it's interesting because the corruption angle is a, um, is a fertile uh, opportunity for, for an administration. And, and, and Emmanuel alluded to this. The Supreme Leader has something called the execution of Imam Khomeini's order, which is essentially his hold co, his holding company, uh, which Reuters estimates to be worth about $95 billion. And it's through ICO that uh, the Supreme Leader, in joint ventures with the Revolutionary Guards, has moved and taken control of significant assets in the Iranian economy. Um, the, the U.S. administration actually, to its credit, designated ICO, 2013 was it? 2013. 2013. Um, and the basis of the designation was corruption. Unfortunately, they are delisting the Supreme Leader's holding company on implementation day, which is six to 12 months from now. So a, a, a Great opportunity, I think, was lost to send a clear message to the Iranian people 
that we will not tolerate corruption and that even though we're doing a nuclear deal and providing you ultimately with hundreds of billions of dollars of sanctions relief, we want that to help the private sector and the Iranian middle class and we want to actually bolster the moderate forces within Iran. But of course we've gone the other way in delisting the Supreme Leader's uh, corrupt co. Uh, so I, I think that there is, but to, Tom, to your point, we have executive orders, we have um, we have legislation actually that, that you've passed, Congress has passed, specifically targeting Iran for corruption. And those authorities do exist. And under the right circumstances, we should enforce those, we use those authorities and enforce that legislation and target corruption. Because I think corruption, as you say, has a, a very potent political message, particularly to those forces within, inside Iran who are trying to, trying to bolster. Ali, do you want to just uh, comment? I mean, is this uh, this issue of the expectations, the popular expectations of what might come from this deal and the gap that the delta that there will be between that and what actually happens and who benefits from this deal, um, is that a potentially potent issue within in Iran? With your permission, I will start with a really, really short joke. Uh, so President Ahmadinejad was having a press conference, you know, because United Nations had declared Iran the second most corrupt country in the world. And the press was attacking him, Mr. President, you know, this, we Iranians, we deserve better, you know, and v what is this result? And Ahmadinejad looks at the press and says, you gentlemen of the press don't understand anything. Have you any idea how much we had to bribe the UN not to be the most <laughs> corrupt country in the world? <laughs> So everybody knows there is a lot of corruption. And now there is a lot of expectations among the Iranian public. In, in, in February 2016, there is going to be parliamentary election in Iran. President Rouhani is going to tell the Iranian voters that he delivered what he promised in the course of, of the campaign. He promised people a nuclear deal. Now, the Iranian public is saying, well, Ahmadinejad, who was you know, on top of management, disastrous manage, management of Iran's economy, he's no longer there, and you got the nuclear deal. Where is the money you promised us? And then Rouhani is going to have a very, very difficult time explaining to the Iranian public that all all the money is actually going to bypass the government coffer and is going to be directed to the revolutionary guards. And that, of course, is, is disastrous for President Rouhani. In that sense, I believe that President Rouhani is committing the same mistake as his predecessor in office, uh, um, Prime, uh, President Rafsanjani. Uh, during, you know, uh, towards the end of the Iran-Iraq war, Mr. Rafsanjani promised the revolutionary guards that their companies would have all the money, all the projects to build Iran Iran after the end of the war. And he, in return, was demanding that the Revolutionary Guard should not intervene in, in the political sphere. You make money, you do business, don't intervene in politics. Rouhani is expecting the same thing from the Revolutionary Guards. He's telling them, have all the money you want, but don't interfere in the political process, don't oppose the nuclear deal exact opposite is going to happen because when the Revolutionary Guards has the money, they are going to back their parliamentary candidates in February 2016. They are going to attack Rouhani for not delivering upon his economic promises to the Iranian public. So in, in that sense, I see Mr. Rouhani as, as the loser, not as the winner of this so-called nuclear victory. Hmm. Yeah, please, Emmanuel. Sorry, uh, brief, two, two very brief points. The first is uh, um, that on the corruption element and how the Iranian uh, public uh, will react to it, I, I happen to be a little pessimistic for the following reason. I, I spend a lot of time uh, monitoring and looking and you could even say stalking uh, on, on social media. A lot of uh, uh, Iranians who are involved in uh, sanction evasion there will no longer be involved in sanction evasion because there will be no sanction soon. But, uh, um, and all of the people that I follow and others I'm aware of m almost invariably are the kind of sophisticated, cosmopolitan, well-traveled, um, highly educated, westernized, moderate Iranians. They, some of them went to top U.S. Um, uh, institutions of higher education. I can think of one who went to Harvard Business School who's doing business with the IRGC. I can think of another one who was uh, George Washington who was part of a money laundering scheme. These are people who have been 
perhaps you know, forced by the circumstances of their country, have been complicit with the regime's activities over the years, have prospered as a result of them, may actually have no choice but being involved in that way to prosper more, and will also be alongside the guards cashing in uh, rewards for their services. So to rely on this upper middle class that seems to be open to more Western standards of, uh, of economic practices and so on, is actually to, to, to only see their superficial outward uh, participation in the global world. Um, but deep down, they are participants and complicit in this vast uh, uh, corruption scheme. I think that your point about uh, European companies is a lot more important, uh, and or it's, it's not more important. Both points were important, but it's a lot more promising because European companies don't want to be on the wrong side of US law and also have to preserve their reputation and to some extent to deal with their own domestic legislations. One possibility is to push for European companies to, a, to demand an exclusion clause for IRGC participation in the contracts that they sign. They should basically say, we are going to do our due diligence on who's our client and who's our partners. But also we demand our partners to provide us the tools for due diligence. And if we discover that you're lying, we will walk away and demand damages. This is a way to defend themselves for the potential fallout from dealing with the IRGC or other corrupt elements of the regime. It is a way to send a message to the Iranians. And it is also a way to expect that business going back into Iran will do their homework better than they used to before sanctions were implemented. I, I would just add to that, I mean, for Congress, a way to operationalize that is to go back to legislation um, that was passed by Congress with respect to SEC filings. So for European companies that are publicly traded, or for any international company publicly traded on, on a US stock exchange, um, because of congressional action right now, they, under their, on their SEC filings, have to file the nature and extent of their Iranian business. Well, you could actually expand on those filing requirements uh, with respect to IRGC disclosure. So they would have to disclose the nature and the extent of their business transactions where the counterparty in that business transaction is a Revolutionary Guard company. Uh, and not just a listed Revolutionary Guard company, but one that is suspected to be a Revolutionary Guard company based on open source information. I think Emmanuel alluded to uh, the information that we have, which tracks um, I think we've got something over a thousand, probably about 1,300 IRGC companies and senior managers based on open source reporting uh, that we've actually turned over to the US Treasury Department. And uh, most of those companies and individuals have not been designated. I think three were designated, of which of the three, two are being delisted. So a net one Iranian entity or person of the 13, 1,400 entities and individuals that we've turned over to the US Treasury Department will remain listed. So that leaves the 1,300 that are not. And so if you actually married the open source reporting on who is IRGC with an SEC requirement that publicly traded companies have to disclose the nature of their Revolutionary Guard activity, then you actually have a, a way to not only get this in the public domain, but actually hold European and other international companies accountable for the business transactions they do with the Revolutionary Guards. And I think that would be a, a pretty powerful tool for, for Congress as it thinks through how to, how to counter Revolutionary Guard aggression and activity. Other questions? Yeah, Don, please. Some semi or near official list right. uh, of entities that are 
committees that, that we're not relying on, you know, kind of press reporting and, and, and kind of weaker open source information. So, Don, I think it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's various ways um, that can that it can be done. I think you you know you played a, a major role in in the legislation that's already on the books um, with respect to the Revolutionary Guards, and I think one of the interesting ways would also to be required determinations. So you give the administration sixty days to make determinations whether a specific list of individuals and entities are IRGC or not. And you know whether you rely on our lists or other lists. I mean, you know, we'll we'll tell you a little bit more about how we compiled our lists. Um, but you actually essentially, you know, I understand. You're on the list, by the way. <laughs> um, just to tell you how good it is. Uh, no, jokes aside. Uh, the the reality is, is you. But, but again, you could, you could require in legislation the President um, and the Treasury Department to make determinations within a certain period of time. And you've done that in the past, for example, with the National Iranian Oil Company, where you gave the U.S. Treasury Department, I think it was 60 days or 30 days, to make a determination whether the National Iranian Oil Company is IRGC controlled. And actually, the administration came back and found they were. Interestingly enough, under the deal, the IRGC controlled National Iranian Oil Company is being delisted by the United States and Europe upon implementation day. So, um, you know, obviously you don't, you're not going to require 1,300 determinations, but certainly you could prioritize from that 1,300 some of the key nodes of the IRGC network and, and, and ask for those determinations to be made. If I may uh, just uh, second what Mark said and also add uh, uh, two, two quick points. The first is uh, that uh, the entire uh, modus operandi of uh, the, not just the IRGC, but the Iranian corporate sector that does the bidding of the regime is to ensure that their corporate structure uh, eludes and bypasses uh, legislation by the U.S. and other countries putting sanctions on, on Iranian activities. It's a bit like, uh, you know, th they basically took a textbook out of all the offshore jurisdictions. Uh, you know, they, they looked at how Liechtenstein and the British Virgin Islands and other such uh, offshore jurisdictions provide uh, discrete incorporation that is, you know, sh shielded away from, from the public eye and then multiplied it by, you know, 10 and added a few other you know creative mechanisms and that's how they build their company so you know treasury operates under the law and the law basically demands the treasury establishes and determines that the IRGC owns a company by 50 percent plus one or the government of Iran and that is the basis for designation so all of the companies we've looked at fail to meet that test or most of them but when you look at their uh, at the corporate structure, which is you know a, a mastery of obfuscation, what you find is that the owners of these companies are actually owned by the company they own themselves. So oftentimes they're you know they're 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 uh, you know they're shell shell games, uh, uh, if you wish. And the key to identifying IRGC influence is that what you find is that these companies are all addressed at the same address as Khata Malambia. They have four or five out of five members of the board of directors that are representatives of Khata Malambia or the IRGC Cooperative Foundation and so on. So, so one way Congress can actually help Treasury uh, go after these companies more aggressively is to, th to change the definition of ownership and control by lowering the threshold, expanding the criteria, that's one way of helping uh, Treasury uh, pursue more, more designations. The second thing that I would say is that once companies have been designated, they almost, and individuals, they almost invariably, um, you know, leave the shell on the side and build new structures. So you have to follow these individuals. When, uh, you know, it's great that Khata Malambia is under sanctions, but Treasury has sanctioned its uh, commander or CEO in 2010. He became oil minister in 2011. 
So he was no longer the commander of Khatam al -Ambiya. Khatam al has a new commander. He is not designated. So Mr. Ebadollah Abdullahi, the new commander of Khatam al can tomorrow travel to you know, the London Conference on Petrochemical Opportunities in Iran and present the work of his front companies as potential you know, partners in contracts. He needs to be designated. So the follow-up and the continuous work of catching up with the shell game is also crucial for, uh, for U.S. sanctions to continue to be effective. Can I just make a quick comment? I, I think, Don, also, we, we talk a lot about designations, and Emmanuel's right, the 50.1% requirement, I mean, lowering that threshold would all be very useful. Um, but I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that short of designations, any kind of disclosure requirement uh, where the U.S. administration would have to disclose the, um, the IRGC companies, uh, even when the ownership is below 50 percent, or that companies and their SEC filings would have to disclose whether the counterparty has, has an IRGC presence in terms of shareholdings or uh, corporate board dominance or senior managers who are IRGC, any kind of disclosure requirement, even if there's no designation, is likely to send a signal to the international financial community and business community that if you do business with said entity, even though they're not formally designated under U.S. law, there could be reputational um, consequences. There could be legal consequences, for example, for those who are trying to enforce judgments on behalf of victims of Iranian terrorism. And so if, if, if Congress can design some kind of reporting requirement that gets the names of these entities and individuals out there, uh, you, you may be able to have a chilling effect on the business with the Revolutionary Guards short of a designation requirement, which obviously has a high threshold in Treasury, despite the great work they do, is just not going to be able to keep up from a designation point of view with this huge pipeline of, of IRGC companies that are being generated, as Emmanuel said, every, every day. All right, we've, uh, uh, getting very close to the end of this, I wonder if, um, Mark in particular, I can just ask you to try and wrap up, summarize, and get on the table um, what you think the agenda going forward might be for both Congress and hopefully for the administration, for people who really do want to um, get serious about uh, not uh, obviously um, uh, stopping this deal, but doing whatever we can uh, in a number of theaters, but particularly with respect to the IRGC to mitigate some of the potentially quite high high risks that we've uh, we've discussed here today and mentioned about what the uh, the second order consequences of this deal might be for American interests vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the IRGC and uh, and its activities throughout the Middle East. If you can just give us your short list of what what that agenda would look like uh, operationally, what the United States ought to be thinking about doing. Sure, John. First of all, I would. Uh, commend that everybody should read Emmanuel's uh, HVAC testimony, which is, copies are over there. I think it's an excellent analysis of the Revolutionary Guards and their role in the Iranian economy. It also contains, beginning on page 25, a superb list of recommendations, that are, all of which are operational. Uh, and I'll do a quick summary of them and, and full credit to Emmanuel and the team for, for some great ideas. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's critical that the, the Congress considered designating the IRGC for its terrorist activities either as an FTO or under Executive Order 13224 or both, and there are some distinct differences between both designations, either or both would be um, consequential. Second, it should be, uh, Congress should declare that it is the policy of the United States that the IRGC is one organization and is responsible for all the activities of its subsidiaries and branches. We need to get rid of this false distinction between the IRGC and the Quds Force and the Basij uh, and, and get rid of this belief, which we don't apply to any other organization that has been designated as a terrorist organization, that there is a distinct political wing uh, that has no control or responsibility for the terrorist activities of its subsidiaries. Um, third, Congress should use the future trade agreement with Europe uh, to limit the IRGC's ability to operate in Europe. Again, the fear that we have is that Europe will become an economic free zone, and the U.S. trade representative has significant leverage over the terms of what we finally agree to in this U.S.-EU free trade agreement. Uh, clearly, we don't want to see European companies doing business with the RevGuards. 
Uh, Emmanuel already alluded to this or spoke explicitly about this, about increasing the number of designations of individuals and companies affiliated with the IOGC by lowering the uh, ownership threshold from 50.1% to something below that. So we actually capture the, the significant influence of the Revolutionary Guards. Um, and just if there's anything else here. Yeah, I, I think I, I spoke about this already, um, but a sort of IRGC watch list uh, where Congress would require Treasury to create an IRGC wa watch list, um, which would report companies that don't reach the threshold for designation, but have IRGC involvement. I actually think this would be a valuable tool for the international business community. I speak to a lot of financial institutions and energy companies and insurance companies, and they have a major compliance problem, right, as a result of all of these sanctions, and, and that compliance problem will remain. Uh, and in fact, if you're on the side of the, of the fence that says we should be supporting economic activity with Iran, right, as an incentive for the Iranians to comply with the nuclear deal, then you should actually support an IOGC watch list that provides international business and international financial institutions with a list that they can go to to say, all right, this transaction is not with the IRGC, so I'm okay to move ahead with this transaction. Because otherwise, you can create a situation where you may have get, you get no international businesses doing business with Iran because everybody is terrified that any business transaction is with the IRGC. Then you get no business transaction, and then you actually create a situation where the uh, expectations of economic relief are not met, giving the Iranians incentive not to comply with their nuclear commitments. So whether you're for the deal or against the deal, whether you want to keep all business out of Iran or whether you actually want to incentivize the Iranians to do business with the outside community, um, a IRGC watch list would actually be useful in actually providing some clarity on who exactly is IRGC and who is not. And Emmanuel already talked about an exclusion clause for ending commercial activities with designated IRGC entities. That's something that Congress can operationalize. So again, I, I'd suggest the testimony is excellent. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more work on this issue and, and happy to engage with you and, and your offices on this issue. Um, but ultimately, just to conclude, the Revolutionary Guards are the most dangerous entity within the Iranian regime. They are the most radical entity. They're in control of the nuclear program, the long-range ballistic missile program. They're responsible for the slaughter in Syria. They are responsible for regional destabilization. And they are in charge of the vast system of domestic repression in Iran. So it is an actor that whether you're for the deal or against the deal, it is an actor that you, we should seek to weaken and marginalize in order to actually help the more moderate elements of the Iranian society and economy to, to thrive and to get some benefits uh, if we're going to help moderate this regime in time um, because we, we don't have much time before those key restrictions on Iran's nuclear program begin sunsetting and Iran expands its program. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. And I, again, I would encourage everybody that there's an, just an enormous wealth of information at FDD. I think we've only scratched the surface today. And for anybody who does have questions or wants to follow up, uh, we've got a terrific congressional team, particularly people on the on the Hill who want to do that, of Toby Dershowitz, uh, Boris Zilberman, and Tyler Stapleton, who are, I think are all here, but, uh, but always at FDD and, and on call and ready to help in any way that, that we can to further this really important agenda and, and address this uh, uh, tremendous challenge to, to the United States and our interests in the, in the Middle East and more broadly. With that, we'll close. Thank you for coming, and please help me in thanking our terrific panelists.